So let's spend some time on questions. Where did the time go? Uh, Leotis. Thank you, Michelle, for your lecture. Really appreciate it. Um, I, I have a few questions just for uh, clarification. So um, how do you think about the emancipation? And before you answer the question, how you presented it was um, you talked about protecting time and this kind of thing of protection. So I'm trying to understand, is your protection of time also related to power? And also you talked about the synchronization. And so is that, does that occur individually or does that, is that pressed upon the individual? And how does emancipation, going back to the emancipation question, is there a difference in emancipation related to the individual or outside the individual? Okay. Thank you. About emancipation, I did not um, mention that earlier. Actually, one of the theses that I'm defending in the book is that I took the, I actually walk on the life history of a, a participant of one of my class with our agreement and we had the opportunity to discuss about it. If I use what I just mentioned here, if I claim that emancipation is a rhythmic process, that means that it should, we should find patterns, periodicity, and movement. So the next question for me was, what may be the patterns that participate to a process of emancipation? What are the kind of experience that we repeat in our life that participate to increase our feeling of agency or autonomy or capacity to have more freedom and so on? And so what I proposed is to consider transgression as a specific pattern that we learn very early in life. I can see that with my little daughter. She learned to transgress pretty fast. And this pattern, transgression, and I'm not saying here transgression from a moral perspective. I just see transgression as the capacity to go through what is expected or what is asked or what is uh, uh, usually uh, experienced in a specific setting. Transgression means trans going through. Uh, moving through. So transgression is something we learn very early. And depending on the family you live in, depending on the social context you live in, it's either inhibited or nurtured. Either you receive the message that it's okay to transgress or you receive the message that you should not disobey and transgression is, uh, is bad. And so through your life, we all develop strategy to transgress because we, there is many times where we cannot do what is expected from us. And so in this life history, I was paying attention to the different strategies that this young woman developed throughout her life to transgress in a way for her to extract herself from an environment that was quite alienating to some extent from cultural, social, intellectual perspective. So the connection I make between emancipation and rhythm is that it goes through the repetition of specific patterns that we develop ourselves. And basically, the, the reason why I, I try to develop this approach is because when I think about my own life, I can see how, and again, I'm quite privileged so we could discuss about the kind of transgression we are talking about, but how the capacity to develop or increase one's own autonomy is not necessarily associated to one significant event. Even if sometimes there is symbolic event that we leave that uh, in, incorporates, basically, but like the butterfly, there is those contractions that we experience that start in the classroom when we are five years old, that continue in the family during teenage years, and we say, no, I don't want to do that, you know? And in adult life, when we decide to, you know, leave a relationship or leave one's job, or I don't know. Um, and so uh, that's how I envision emancipation as a rhythmic process, as a process that goes through the repetition of specific patterns through a movement that is the movement of one's life, basically. Sometimes we get stuck in the strategy that we have uh, developed. Uh, for example, this person at some point used traveling as a way to escape each time she feels that she doesn't know how to handle a critical situation. But by keeping traveling, you may lock yourself in a situation where you don't settle at some point, and that can become in itself a source of alienation. So what I'm trying to say here also is that strategies that we develop to emancipate ourselves sometimes backfire. And therefore, it's important to be aware of what we are reproducing when we evolve. Now, for the second part of the question about the individual collective part and how it relates with the way we protect time, um, 
we are struggling with social forces that are very strong when we say that we need to be able to protect time for slowness, for example, for self-reflection. Um, the forces of working environment, the forces of institution like capitalism, and uh, they are, I mean, they are societal forces. So we can develop strategies on our own, but to some extent, at some point, they, they have to become collective. And that's why the slow movement, for example, is something that gets traction collectively as an alternate way to conceive the temporalities of different activities, whether it's slow food or slow education, for example. I don't know if I'm answering your question there, but. Thanks. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, my question is about caffeine. Caffeine. Caffeine, yes. So I'd argue that uh, caffeine is human's strategy for having more mental stimulation so that they can conform to the heterogeneous synchronicities in our life, getting up, getting to the office at, this, at a certain time, or doing all the requirements we have to do. So my question is, if society decides to give up caffeine, is that a way to emancipate ourselves from this uh, pressure of synchronicity? Or is that going to increase our tension and challenge? Well, I would say every society, every culture has its own way to make sure that people get stimulated. So there is caffeine, there is other form of drugs uh, that we can use to stimulate ourselves. Um, When I mentioned earlier, when we have the feeling to struggle with time, so for example, when we have the feeling that we are tired, but we need to be able to be awake, like it may be the case right now for some of you, um, what we do is that we're experiencing conflicting rhythms. The rhythms of the body in this case, or the way our cognition, or brain process information, and social demand. It can be social demand at work, can be in an educational setting. So I don't know if we need to think about how society as a whole need to handle this kind of question, but what we need to question from a social, societal perspective is where we put the priorities. Because it's about synchronizing, synchronizing our biorhythm with the rhythm of the collectivity we live in. And the question is, do we have the freedom required to make an informed choice or are we just constrained to have to drink caffeine in order to just make it every morning uh, when we are at work? The problem is, where are the space where we discuss those matter, those issues? And that's, I think, something in education we need to think about because, uh, again, you are going to, for, for new court here in ages, you're going to have two weeks where you're going to drink a lot of coffee, probably. <laughs> and. Um, you know, for us, it's a challenge, I think, as faculty member, because uh, there are forces that we have very, margin, very little margin to work on. And uh, I don't know, that's an open reflection we may have at some point or to develop. What are the strategies? Because we can adjust, we can cope, but to some extent. Hi, Professor. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Achilles. I'm a master's student in adult learning and leadership here. And before coming to TC, uh, I started politics as an undergrad. So I worked for about five years in a variety of political campaigns. And I always share that what I really liked about campaigns was how fast they moved, meaning that you made a lot of mistakes fairly quickly, multiple times a day, but you were also forced to fix them really quickly and therefore learning and transformation happened rather fast. It also meant that we were making lots of mistakes towards the end especially. So that's something that I struggled with and confronted a lot because of my last presidential campaign that I worked in as training director, I had to think about prioritizing knowledge and what we were gonna have our staff and volunteers learn in the period of time that I had, precisely because I was in the state of Florida and the first day on the job, um, I was told by my boss, we're gonna replicate what the President Obama's campaign did in 11 months four years ago, but we have three months to do it. And so my question to you is, thinking about how exciting uh, accelerated learning can be, but also thinking about from the perspective of how do we prioritize knowledge, especially when 
training professionals like myself have to make those decisions uh, given the time period that we have. I'm not sure I, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly I'm going to answer your question. I, I hear two things in your question. The idea of prioritizing and how we learn to prioritize and the phenomenon of acceleration. I'll start with the second one. Sociologists now have written, and there's been for the last 10, 15 years, things written about social acceleration. The fact that uh, to some extent changes, social changes occur at a faster pace today than it used to be in the past. Uh, due, part of it has to do with the acceleration of uh, technological change, but also the acceleration of social uh, life also. So there is a trend there that's historical uh, to some extent. Now, uh, it has, it's not the first time in history that we observe that. Uh, if you look at the literature in education a century ago, in the early 1900s, actually, people were complaining about the, f the thing that the, the fact that things were going too fast, and it had to do with industrial revolution at that time and the uh, introduction of the new technology of that time, which was the steam machine and, uh, and the new communication means. So in, we can say through history, there is time where things get accelerated. Some sociologists think that it's going to continue like that. I don't know. I've personally, I'm more thinking about the fact that we go through rhythm, so therefore there is maybe high intensity and lower intensity of acceleration. So I guess in your specific uh, field, the question is up to which point you can continue accelerating what you are doing. At some point, you just physically won't be able to, uh, either because of the way you process information or just the way uh, psychologically you can handle it. Uh, the risk with those phenomena is that at some point we just burned out. And that's, I mean, if burnout is today such a huge issue in working environment, it has to do with that. Uh, because to some extent people don't have the capacity and the possibility to take distance with the pace of what they are doing. So I would suggest you to think about um, the level, I mean, until which point you can continue compressing what you are doing. And for prioritizing, I think the question is really a matter of synchronization. You know, what are the rhythms that you can privilege? Um, and what are the rhythms that you choose to privilege in your activity? And, uh, but again, that can be a reflection that you may have collectively. I, I don't know exactly the detail of what you're doing, so it's difficult for me to be more specific. But um, yeah, that's how I, I hear what you ask. Oh, OK, hi. Um, I'm drawing some parallels between your work and physics. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about light as both a wave and a particle and time being similar. And I'm asking myself if time is an artificial construct and that the laws of entropy and stochasticity might apply, and therefore time might not be rhythmic and it might not be cyclical in the way that you describe. So, um, and, and the theory of relativity and the multiverse come in when I think about that. OK. I'm not going to go there because it's not a field that uh, I master. However, there is a very important thing I would like to say here. Um, yes, time is a social construct. If you ask sociologists about it, you will find mostly the position that time is something that we collectively uh, define, including time in physics, because it has to do with the way physicists agree together to describe specific phenomenon. And there is a history of how they do that. So from that point of view, yes, time is a social construct. And therefore, we can question how socially, how collectively we give meaning to what we mean by time. Now, as you said, there is also physical phenomena that occur. And that occur in a different way if we get very close to the speed of light or if we are in the realm of action like we are here in a more kind of medium range physical phenomena, temporalities are not the same. So, and those temporalities are ruled by different principles. So I would not pronounce myself about the rhythmicity of physical time, whether we talk about it in thermodynamics or in uh, quantum physics, uh, because I have no expertise there. But I think it's important to keep in mind because that's the problem in science. We tend to see things in silo and therefore divide things. And there is yeah, the time for, philosoph from, yeah, for philosopher or for physicist and the time in society. But they are all related because if you think about computer, for example, 
the time that rule the way a computer works is a physical time. It's not a time that is a social construct. I mean, the meaning we give to it is socially constructed. But the way a processor can process information is clearly a physical process that, use, that goes with speed of light and so on. So therefore, the temporality at this level is ruled by specific uh, temporalities. So for us in education, because we're not talking about speed of light when we are working in the classroom, I think what's important is to be aware again that there is multiple temporalities, and I don't want to repeat myself here, that are ruled by different principles, by different laws, and some we have access to, some we don't have access to. The question is how we make meaning of that. I thought, well, <clears throat> while we're in the realm of physics, um, I thought I'd take it one step farther. And that is, um, there are two parts. <clears throat> one is the time is obviously mutable. We know now that it's related to acceleration. So that if you put a, uh, a clock that circles the Earth so many times, it will, when it comes back, it will be desynchronized from an atomic clock on, the worth, on, the, in, on Earth. And even worse, uh, there, one, my understanding is that one of the two major theories about time is that time is omnitaneous. That uh, in, if you look at space time as a loaf, um, where you are in any point in time depends on how you slice the loaf. Just as a simple example, although we're completely unaware of it, when you cross the street, the list of things that's going on in your world is different from the list of things that was going on from the person you left on the other side. And that's unobservable completely, but if you were trillions and trillions of light years apart, the theory holds, and I understand that, that this is one of the two major theories, that you may go 200 years into the future or the past simply by walking to the, walking to the newsstand so the question, uh, when one is aware of that, um, I think it changes one's attitude toward time. And I, I often wondered if we would live in the world of relativity. But anyway, I think you see what I'm getting at. Well, I think listening to you, what you make me think about, and it's also another way to respond to the earlier question. There is, in society, imaginary representation of what time is. If you go back to Newton, time was about you know, the arrow and whatever occurs in the physical world, you can reverse back and uh, bring it back to where it used to be, and that's okay. And that, today, is the dominant representation still of what time is about, not among physicists but among other people, because we internalize that. In society vehicles some kind of representation about what time is. That's why, for most people, time is about what the clock shows. The problem is, in education, is that somewhere we could say we have been colonized by those representations, meaning that the way we think about time in education is framed by the way physicists, physicists from the 1600s, uh, have been thinking about those questions. And we could say, obviously, since then, there has been thermodynamics. Thermodynamics taught us that time is actually irreversible. Whatever occurs in the world, you cannot go back. Once you know, we put ink in a glass of water, you, know, you cannot easily remove the ink from the water. It's something that is quite irreversible, if you consider the energy that it requires to do that. So it's another way to think and fantasize about time. We can think about our life as irreversible. It's another way to imagine the temporality of our Life. So what I'm trying to say here is that I think it's important to question how we are influenced by representations of time that eventually determine how we experience it. To give you a very concrete example, the Apple Watch or whatever bracelet we use you know, to measure the rhythm of our bodies and the rhythm of our physical activity, we can see that as a progress because it brings people to be more self-aware about some of the rhythms of their physical embodied uh, activity. But there is something very vicious, I think, in the use of and the, 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 the diffusion of this representation of time, is that it's fundamentally a quantitative 
understanding of what time and rhythms is about. Because those devices only measure rhythms that can be observed and quantified. Biologists who work on the rhythm of the body, they only work on rhythms that you can measure and observe. What I've tried to discuss with you today about the rhythms that constitute the way we evolve, it's not something we can necessarily quantify. Even if we talk about repetition, the question is not how many times in your life did you say no and did you transgress in specific questions. It's not the number that counts, it's the quality of the experience that counts. So the problem for me with referring to conception of time that comes from other disciplines, if we don't, if we don't do it in a critical way, is that we tend to, um, reproduce a conception of time that may not be relevant for what we are trying to study. And I do believe that in education, the phenomena that we are studying, how people change, how people appropriate for themselves knowledge, develop skills, are following temporalities that, yes, we can quantify, obviously, to some extent, how long did it take you to be able to learn that. It's not that that's important. It's the process that goes into it. And therefore, there are other qualities that we may have to learn how to name in order to describe and interpret. And, and that's where, for me, the struggle is between disciplines. Uh, doesn't mean that we have to you know, put in the garbage uh, what's, what's been done in physics, but it's about critically reflecting on it. Yeah. Hi, right, good evening. Uh, I had a question going back to the earlier conversation about emancipation. And I wonder if you looked at, uh, so in thinking about conflicting temporalities, did you look at um, the the rhythm of oppression as a way to counteract or to bring about emancipatory education. And if we could identify that, if we could look at that, do you see that as a way to develop academic or educational programs that are specifically designed to tear down oppression and emancipate? Hmm. Well, When I started thinking about the temporality of emancipation, obviously I had to go back to what exists already, and you have to go back to Marx, actually, because Marx was one of the first critical theorists to think about the connection between uh, the experience of time and alienation. And he wrote in the context of the, revolution, the Industrial Revolution. And so if we take, for example, the assembly line, you know, that's linked to the tailorization of work, uh, as a uh, emblematic figure of alienation, doing the same thing again and again and again. That's an expression of how a specific experience of time can be experienced as alienating. So for me to connect the question of the temporality of oppression or alienation to the experience of time and rhythms, we need to go back to um, that slide. It's when you think about the periodicity of rhythms that you find elements that allow to think about alienation from a temporal perspective. I mean, one way. Actually, we could, we could probably think from the other lens also. But for example, we experience a feeling of alienation when we keep repeating things in a way where we do not have the freedom to change the patterns, actually, that we are displaying. So to relate to education, I mean, schooling is alienating to some extent because kids have to go back to a school that has a pace that is imposed on them for very obvious reason. I mean, there is a history of why those paces have been developed because historically, schooling was about preparing children to become future workers on the assembly line. Modern education is really about that to some extent. Um, so the question in order to think critically about how the system in which we are working may be oppressive from a temporal perspective, we need to think about how we can introduce diverging periodicities. How can we introduce way to experience what we are doing so that it is not just the repetition of the same thing? And there's been a lot of experimentation in schooling around that. In France, for example, there's been, and it went all the way to the political sphere with a lot of discussion at the political level uh, they call that the rythme scolaire, the school rhythms, basically, and based on research made in chronobiology and chronopsychology, showing the necessity to rethink how the schedule of uh, education, formal education, be conceived so that kids don't just, you know, uh, get alienated by the repetition of, of um, uh, activities. And in the U.S., there is also a amount of, of literature on that. But I'm not sure I'm answering. I hope I answer your question. 
Thank you, Michelle. And we'll do one last question, and then we will let the discussion continue in the Everett Lounge, where we have a nice reception waiting for everyone. Thanks. Thank you for the great talk, Michelle. Um, you touched on it a little bit, and I feel like it's one of the most obvious questions, really. But um, you talked a little bit about um, capitalistic forces being one of those that are keeping some of the patterns and processes in place um, for the specific temporalities in education. It, it strikes me as um, one of the most difficult to break free of in, in the sense that the commoditization of higher education, for example, um, is such that the, the value of what you're learning and what you come out of that experience um, with it, seems to be largely tied to the periods of time that you spend with specific, um, you know, in specific kinds of institutions. And even as we try to break out of those with, with MOOCs and free um, programs that are out there, that that value isn't attributed to those similar um, learning opportunities out there. And I wonder if you have some thoughts about um, just other possible ways of breaking out of that periodicity periodicity mm. that is um, brought on by the commoditization of education? Mm. No, there is, I think there is no easy answer to this question. I think really it's, it's why it's important to engage into a reflection and into action also that help challenging the patterns in which we are uh, locked to some extent. Because I think that's where suffering comes from, is when we feel locked into um, uh, a system, value system, that valorizes a specific form of rhythms over others. So maybe the first way is to try to, as you suggest in your question, try to envision other rhythms. And that's, I think, what the slow movement is doing by saying, hey, guys, we can do things in a slow way. And in a way, all the trend around, for example, mindfulness uh, has to do with that, the idea of going totally reverse model of being into the present, you know, and slowing down and so on. So that's one form of uh, experience that somewhere uh, meets that concern. But the problem is to become, to, to, to be locked into a dualistic model where it's either one or the other, either fast or slow. And, and so that's why I think engaging into a reflection to try first before to find solution to just understand what are the rhythms involved in the situation we are living in. Whether it's a classroom, whether it's the activity of a team that works together, what are the rhythms involved? And there is study also in social psychology around that, the rhythms of team working, for example. So I think first about understanding. And that's why I think we need to train professionals who have this kind of capacity, this feeling for understanding and, and identifying the rhythms that are there, and then after, once we realize what are the real rhythms implemented by people in real life situation, we may move on by trying to develop alternative. One thing I just would like to add, because I didn't mention it in my presentation, and, and it came also in one of the questions that was raised, is that um, one way to experience temporal alienation has to do not just with the capacity to and all different rhythms or that conflict with each other, but also just being locked in a specific moment of one's life that is characterized by his own rhythmicity. And here I think that the example of addiction, to go back to caffeine, is a very significant one. I don't know if there's been study about the evolution of addiction historically, but I would not be surprised if there is a correlation between addictive behaviors and the rise of capitalism. Uh, not to blame capitalism on addiction, but just to say there is a correlation between social demands on people's performances and the level of rigidity displayed and the fact that we get locked into compulsive behaviors. The thing with compulsive behavior, usually compulsive behavior are normal behaviors at the origin, whether it's drinking alcohol, caffeine, um, um, playing, gambling, um, sexual activity, those activities are normal in itself. They become compulsive when we get stuck into the repetition of the same patterns and that the entire life starts revolving around a specific moment that has its own rhythm. And so I think we need to question also 
that's another way to think about the, 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 the work we are doing and the, the world we are living in and how much freedom people have to maintain, sustain some form of fluidity between the different moments of their existence so that they don't get stuck, becoming workaholic, for example, or being, you know, any other kind of activity. So I think that's, that's another way to think about that uh, and to think about caffeine also. Thank, thank you very much, Michelle. This thank you. Great. And thank you to the alumni office, and I'll welcome everybody to the Everett Lounge uh, where we have our reception. <laughs>